Hi everyone. In this video lecture, we will cover basically uh, the physical agents that uh, induce ther uh, thermal uh, effects, no? thermal therapeutic effects in the human body. So as an introduction, uh, basically we have thermal agent. When we say thermal agents, we can refer to agents that they increase uh, the, the body temperature or if they lower the down the body temperature as well okay so as like a general terminology we say thermal agents for both uh, heat or cold okay so thermal agents they act on the transfer of heat to the patient body okay or from the patient body okay in case of cryotherapy of application of cold okay um, if we take this example of a pan here we have we are boiling water in this example here uh, we have fire and you see here the the flames uh, they will they will uh, dissipate heat okay so this heat here is dissipated by radiation okay and we have in physical therapy uh, some examples of uh, agents that they induce, uh, they transfer heat by radiation. Uh, examples, we have the infrared light, okay, so this is uh, any type of light that um, transfer heat is, uh, is because of this mechanism of radiation, okay. We have here inside the pan, the, the boiling water, Okay, so boiling water uh, transfers heat by convection. Okay, so this is this mechanism of convection. This requires uh, the presence of fluid. Okay, so with the movements of fluids, we can transfer heat by convection. Examples of convection we have, uh, as we learned uh, previously in hydrotherapy. Uh, we can use a whirlpool, okay, which is that tank uh, with warm water that is agitated, okay, so that agitated water in the tank, this will um, transfer heat by convection, okay. And finally, uh, conduction is another heat transfer uh, mechanism that requires uh, physical contact between objects, okay. So here we have a hand. The hand is holding here uh, the, the pan, okay? So the heat is transferred by uh, physical contact. So we have conduction in this case. And example of conduction, we have like hot packs that they will, uh, is an object that will uh, transfer, physically transfer the heat to the human body. So those are the three uh, basic um, mechanisms for heat transfer, okay? But we also have a, a fourth one, which is called conversion. So in conversion, this converts non-thermal energy into heat, okay? So examples of physical agents that transfer non-thermal energy to heat. We have ultrasound, for example, will transfer uh, mechanical energy, okay, or sound energy into a heat, okay. So ultrasound is uh, is considered a conversion method for heat transfer. The physical agents that um, induce that induce or promote heat in our body, they can be classified in superficial heat agents and deep heat agents okay in case of superficial agents uh, those agents here they will induce uh, an increase of tissue temperature uh, of two centimeters okay in the surface of the the tissue so that's why they are called superficial they the heat penetrates only about two centimeters so the application of superficial heat agents uh, are mainly uh, found on the scars uh, and on superficial soft tissues, okay, including uh, 
the skin or superficial muscles, superficial tendons, okay? And for those types of uh, superficial heat agents, we mainly uh, use those three different methods for heat transfer. We have conduction, convection, and radiation. And here we have some examples of those, okay? Conduction, we have hot packs and paraffin that we will uh, see here in this um, lecture. We have convection, the example of the whirlpool, okay? Or a hot tub. And radiation, uh, we have infrared lamps, okay? They transfer heat by radiation. In case of deep heat agents, uh, those agents here, they can uh, induce an increase in tissue temperature of up to five centimeters uh, deep in the skin, okay? So this uh, is mainly applied on joint capsules and deep soft tissues, okay? Including deep muscles, deep tendons, ligaments, okay? And for applying, for the application of deep heat agents, we mainly use the conversion uh, method of transferring heat. Okay, so uh, examples, we have electromagnetic energy, okay, as shortwave diathermy or microwave diathermy, and the mechanical energy, which is the therapeutic ultrasound, which will convert um, sound to heat. And this here will convert electromagnetic energy to heat. Okay, so those modalities here, all those modalities here, they can produce deep heat. Right, having this in mind, uh, we can say that in thermotherapy, uh, is, thermotherapy is basically defined as the application of heat for therapeutic purposes. So those are the main biological effects that we observe when we apply heat to our body. We see effects on the hemodynamics, on the neuromuscular system, in the metabolism, and the, in the connective tissue extensibility. The first effects in hemodynamics, uh, we are talking about uh, the vessels. What happens in the vessels that are carrying blood? When we apply heat, uh, we, the, the, the first response that we see is vasodilation, okay? So, but why does uh, vasodilation uh, occur? Okay, so we basically have a direct reflex activation of the smooth muscles in the vessels, okay? And these um, smooth muscles, they are, uh, actually they are activated by cutaneous uh, thermoreceptors, okay? So we have thermoreceptors in our skin. Those thermoreceptors will uh, detect the increase of temperature in the tissue, okay? And this will cause a direct uh, uh, parasympathetic activation, okay? Uh, in, in here, as a response, we have nitric oxide produced, uh, is produced uh, in, the, um, in the blood vessels, okay? So there is a local release of chemical inflammatory molecules. And nitric oxide is an example of these uh, molecules. And when nitric oxide is produced, this will promote vasodilation, okay? So nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator in the vessels. In the neuromuscular system, uh, we also have some changes that occur. They are mainly uh, changes in nerve conduction velocity and the firing rate, okay? So those are the effects that we observe, uh, decreased pain perception. So this means that uh, the person can be, uh, have, the person has like a higher pain threshold, okay? So the person is uh, more, um, is less sensitive to pain, okay, in other words. 
uh, increased range of motion and increased general relaxation. And why, uh, why not? How does this mechanism occur? So we know that in the in our musculoskeletal system we have the present the presence of um, receptors. Okay, so those are stretch receptors in the muscle. Okay, this is the muscle spindle, and in the tendon we have another stretch receptor which is the Golgi tendon organ. So as a reflex is as a a reflex response from the stretching of the muscle spindle. So when the muscle spindle is stretched, so this will uh, here will uh, produce a response to contract the muscle. Okay, so this is a protective response to avoid overstretching of the muscle. So to avoid uh, possible tears of the muscle. So the muscle spindle acts in order to uh, contract this muscle, okay? And in case of the Golgi tendon organ, uh, when the Golgi tendon organ uh, is stretched, so this receptor will signal the stretch here and will therefore uh, relax the muscle, okay? So the response of the GTO is the opposite than the muscle spindle. So, Having this in mind, when we apply heat, uh, what happens to the muscle spindle? The muscle spindle here uh, is inhibited, okay? So there is an inhibition of this uh, afferent fiber, okay? The fiber of the muscle spindle is fiber 2 afferent. So this fiber here is inhibited, okay? And at the same time, the Golgi tendon organ is activated. So this is, uh, there is a, a decreased firing, okay, of the muscle spindle and an increased firing of uh, fiber 1B. This is the afferent fiber 1B of the GTO, okay. So this is, let's say, inhibited or decreased, the muscle spindle, and this is, uh, increased, is activated. So as a, a response, what will happen to the motor neuron? This neuron here that will produce the, the response to the muscle. The motor neuron will have a decreased, um, a decreased response, a decreased, a decreased firing rate, okay, as a response of the decreasing firing rate of the muscle spindle and the increased firing rate of the Golgi tendon organ. So the motor neuron, okay, uh, the alpha motor neuron here will uh, relax. So this is what happens when we apply heat to the muscle, okay? We have these changes in nerve conduction velocity, firing rates, uh, and as a consequence, we can reduce muscle spasm uh, when we apply heat to the muscle. We have changes in the metabolism. Those changes, they are mainly caused uh, by the increase in the metabolic rate, okay? So in normal circumstances, as we see here in this picture, we have uh, the blood vessel here, and here the tissue on the top, okay? And those uh, purple circles are the oxygen, and the green ones are carbon dioxide. Okay. So in normal circumstances, we have a balance of those gases here in the extracellular fluid, okay, the, the extracellular matrix. Uh, and when we have uh, the, an increase in the metabolic rate, what happens then? More oxygen is consumed here by those cells, okay, and we have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the extracellular fluid, okay? This higher concentration of carbon dioxide, this will be responsible for uh, triggering um, a, a smooth muscle response of vasodilation, as you see here in picture C, okay? So have less oxygen and more carbon dioxide and this uh, imbalance between those uh, these these gases will produce um, 
vasodilation in the smooth muscles. And when we have vasodilation, this will increase the blood flow, okay? So in order to restore the equilibrium of gases in the tissue, okay? So with more blood flow here, we'll, we, can, uh, we can have more oxygen back again here, okay? Um, so those are the changes, uh, metabolic changes caused by heat in the tissues. And we also have changes in the connective tissue extensibility. Those changes, they are believed to occur, okay, because we, um, when we have uh, the connective tissues, their composition is basically col col collagen, okay, so um, collagen is the most like predominant um, molecule uh, present in the um, in connective tissues and when we apply heat to these uh, tissues um, this is believed that heat when is applied with stretching okay this will increase the elongation of the the fibers okay so the temperature elevation in combination with stretch can alter the viscoelastic properties of the connective tissue uh, the maintained elongation of those collagen tissues causes changes in the organization of collagen fibers. This is because of plastic deformation. So plastic deformation is uh, linked with these viscoelastic properties. What is that? So as an example, if I have an elastic here in my hand, okay, I will deform this elastic okay, at this stage. So I am deforming the elastic. Uh, the maximum as I can. So I will keep this deformation like for a long period. I keep this deformation like I will stay till tomorrow holding this elastic here at the same position. Okay, so what can we observe? That in the beginning, when I stretch, when I do a maximum stretch in this elastic, this is completely tense. Okay, and then when I keep this tension when i keep this length okay like one day after this tension will be less will be lower than uh, than initially okay and this is because of the viscoelastic properties the viscoelastic properties they um they produce like a residual um elongation of extensible tissues okay and this is what happens uh with the muscle okay or with the tendon with the... so all the the soft tissue structures that are extensible in our body they have these viscoelastic uh properties so this will result in a greater increase of length okay when the stretching force is applied so the the person will require less force to stretch a muscle okay and the risk of, of tissue tearing will be reduced because of that okay so uh, the the application of heat uh, in combination with stretch is beneficial okay for those reasons so having those effects in mind okay that what heat can promote in the human body okay we have some different uh, techniques uh, of heat application okay so we have for example hot packs uh, those packs that you see here in this picture those white ones so we have different uh, shapes or uh, sizes as well and they can be applied to different areas of the body so what's inside these hot packs? There is a gel, silicate gel, uh, inside this cotton, uh, in a cotton pad. Those, uh, those uh, hot packs, normally in clinics, you can see those tanks here, okay? So those are called hydrocollator units. And they have boiling water inside these tanks of approximately 160 degrees Celsius. Um, so the, the hot packs, they are kept here 
normally inside the, the, these units. And when we want to use, to apply to a patient, okay, you can see in this link here, uh, we take this from the unit and we normally we wrap these hot packs in towels when they don't apply this directly to the skin because this could burn the skin of the patient, okay? So it's normal to use um, like a layer of towels to, to, to protect the patient's skin, okay? And then the average time for application is 20 minutes. Uh, this is, is easy to use, okay? So this is inexpensive. Uh, low level of skill is needed, so everyone can apply it, even at home, okay? Um, and is, uh, is good also for moderate to large areas, so including the, the back, for example, as you saw in the previous picture. The disadvantages are that uh, sometimes those, uh, those hot packs, they can be too heavy and the patient can uh, be, this can generate discomfort for the patient, okay? So the patient can not tolerate the, the weight of the hot pack. Uh, another disadvantage is that when we apply it, uh, we cover the area the back for example and normally we have to keep in mind if the, there is any adverse effect or reaction produced by this pack over the skin so it's um, recommended to always uh, take this hot pack or from the from the patient and watch the area watch for any adverse effects so this is a, a disadvantage that we cannot watch like 100 percent of the time because it's covering the skin okay and another the third disadvantage is that uh, the hot pack may not be able to maintain a good contact with the skin uh, if this if the area that you want to, to treat is like uh, has irregular contours so this can create like uneven heating to the, to the tissues. Then we have this other technique. This is the paraffin wax. The, this is basically a, a type of wax that is mixed with mineral oil, okay? The mineral oil is basically to decrease the, the melting temperature of paraffin, okay? So the paraffin, uh, when when it's uh, we have this mixed uh, this mixture, the melting temperature is approximately uh, fifty five degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is uh, mainly applied for extremities. Okay, for the hands or for the feet, and an advantage is that this can uh, promote a good contact with highly contoured areas, including like. The in between the fingers, okay, or um, even the wrist as well, okay. And the disadvantages are that this is kind of messy, okay, so uh, time consuming, consuming as well, because uh, sometimes, like, it takes uh, 20 minutes uh, approximately for this treatment, as you can see here in this video. Uh, the patient immerses uh, the, the hand here, for example, approximately three times, okay? And then uh, he takes the, the hand out of the, of the bath, of this paraff paraffin bath, and the hand is covered with uh, paper or plastic during approximately 20 minutes. Um, and then after that, you, you can see the hand as a glove, okay? Like totally white because of paraffin. The problem um, is that this uh, could like potentially, it's time consuming because you can, you have to avoid like a risk of cross infection or contaminations, okay? So you cannot, reuse the same paraffin for 
another patient, okay? So every time you have a patient here, you have to change the whole paraffin here and set it up again. Okay, so that's why this is messy and time consuming. Um, and this is kind, honestly, this is kind of old fashioned technique. Okay, so in America, this is not used anymore. Uh, in Spain, still, yes, you can see uh, some clinics that they use paraffin wax. But overall, this is quite an old fashioned uh, technique. We have contrast bath. Uh, this technique basically uh, alternates the immersion of the extremities in cold water or warm water. Uh, this is, um, the good thing is that this uh, also promotes uh, good contact with the contoured extremities, okay? Uh, and this is, it is believed that the, this technique promotes a more vigor, vigorous circulatory effect than heat alone or than cold alone, okay? Um, the mechanisms are still not fully understood, okay? But this is believed that this activates the vasospasm um, of the arteries, okay? So we could have like more, um, uh, circulatory effects because alternating cold and hot. Um, in this video, you see that uh, there is a patient with um, uh, a patient that underwent a surgery in the elbow. Okay, and this patient needs to, uh, apart from promoting tissue um, uh, extensibility, uh, one of the goals is also to um, promote some strength, okay, some muscle strength. So the application of uh, active movements uh, can also be done with this technique. So in this video, in this link here, you see a patient holding a sponge, okay, in the affected arm and immerses the hand in warm water first. And then uh, the patient takes uh, his hand from the from the bucket and has to squeeze the the sponge okay so this movement of squeezing is also working the the musculature okay of the wrist fingers wrist okay um, we can also work in combination uh, with active movements okay uh, and the disadvantage is basically that the, some patients, they don't tolerate cold that much. Okay, so this can be uncomfortable. And so we don't use it if the patient doesn't tolerate uh, such uh, cold temperatures. Uh, the application of therapeutic heat has some contraindications, okay? So the main indications are, uh, contraindications are recent hemorrhage area. So because this could cause, this could potentiate bleeding, okay? Thrombophlebitis, uh, impaired sensation, malignant tumors, okay? So this one thrombophlebitis because this could, um, detach the, the thrombus, okay, from the artery or from the vein, and this uh, thrombus could um, detach and uh, travel through the bloodstream, okay, and eventually reach the lungs. Uh, and we could see a condition called um, embolia. Embolia uh, and the impaired sensation because per the patients cannot tell if this uh, is hot or cold, so this could um, cause burn. Okay, malignant tumor because this could uh, potentiate the tumor tumor activity. And the precautions we should take precautions of heat when there is edema because. Uh, as you mentioned, as you saw previously, uh, heat causes vasodilation, okay? And when you have vasodilation uh, in edema, this could potentiate, even potentiate edema, 
with the extravasation of more fluid to 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 the edema. Okay, so that's why this uh, we, this is a precaution. Uh, and pregnancy, because this is actually the effects are not um, very well understood. Okay, so we it's better not to apply heat over the abdomen or the pelvic area of a pregnant woman. And those here are the potential adverse effects that uh, could be caused by heat. Okay, so burns if the temperature is too high. Uh, fainting because this could also um, somehow um, induce like um, a lack, uh, a decrease, a, a decrease circulation to the brain. Okay, so the patient could potentially faint and bleeding as well. So that's it for now. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon in the next video.